Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We thank you for your presence here at the meeting of the Leon County Board of County Commissioners this October 11, 20 and 22. Our agenda today proposes to be um, a short one. Uh, we're going to carefully uh, meander through what we have before us. Uh, we have uh, for our prayer, Pastor Tom Oldcraft of the St. Stephen Lutheran Church. And uh, we invite you now for invocation to be followed by our Pledge of Allegiance. Let us all stand. Wasn't sure if the pledge was first or not. Prayer first. Gathered and embraced by a loving God, let us calm our hearts, still our minds while counting our breath in silence to sense and connect the divine in our midst. God of all creation, we come to you in prayer today, for we need guidance. We seek you, for we are lost and a broken people. A lost community in the wilderness where many of our siblings encounter trials and, suffer and sufferings. Much of our world is in perpetual dispute we fight with one another, we become attached to false gods. Yet you walk with us, and you teach us to see you in one another and to experience you in nature. Lead us to work together in ways that build bridges and repair relationships. Touch our lips with holy and purifying embers of coal. Create in us clean hearts. Make all leaders guardians of the common good and defenders of justice. We ask you, O oh God, to instill in us the same preferences for the poor that you have. Light up our hearts so that we are not bound by false things like money, power, safety, and security, especially when it's at the expense of others. Deliver creativity into our county commissioners to work together to find common ground between sides and to promote support and act for the common good. A common good which recognizes that you, O oh God, do not make distinctions, but see into our hearts and know us through and through. For your guidance we pray and for your will of the Spirit to reveal that we make distinctions in our living and in our politics, and when we do this, we pit one against the other and hinder you, O oh God, and in that case might even be found fighting against you. Let it not be so. We thank you, creator of heaven and earth, for the heartbeat and the breath you give us. We thank you for not giving up on us, for walking in the valley of the shadow of death with us, and for the awesome responsibility you have given to these in this room to pass healthy and just policy. Open us to offer a hand up to those who are hurting, keeping us mindful of people without homes and those who lack food, those who seek meaningful work and livable wages those hurt by gun violence and addictions, and mindful of those who live right across the street from us. Come, Lord God, have mercy, give blessing and strength to these in this room who can make positive differences right now in the lives of Leon County. Grant us courage to live according to your commandment to love God and one another. May goodness, mercy, and love flow from you to us in all we say and do. Amen. Amen. Let us recite now the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Pastor Holcraft. We appreciate your uh, opening prayer. And we thank the members of persons who assembled today uh, for this meeting. This time we want to ask if Commissioner um, Carolyn Cummings would, uh, on behalf of the board, uh, would read our uh, Breast Cancer Awareness Month uh, proclamation. And I believe... Uh,
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Will the representatives regarding this proclamation please come forward? This is the National Breast Cancer Awareness Month proclamation. Okay, and this is the proclamation. Whereas October 2022 marks 37 years that National Breast Cancer Awareness Month has educated women about early breast cancer detection, diagnosis, and treatment. And whereas it is estimated that more than 176 women in Leon County will be diagnosed with breast cancer in 2022, and more than 32 will die from the disease. And whereas one in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer within their lifetime. And whereas breast cancer is the second most common form of cancer and the second leading cause of cancer death for women in the United States. And whereas with routine mammogram screening and follow-up testing, breast cancer can be detected early when it can be more effectively treated and whereas being aware of the health information, education, treatment, and support available for individuals with breast cancer can help people receive appropriate care and resources to improve their quality of life. And whereas Leon County is renewing its commitment to supporting prevention, detection, and treatment of breast cancer, and whereas Leon County encourages people to recognize that breast cancer is treatable, and that routine screening of early detection can save lives. And whereas the American Cancer Society has searched endlessly for a cure through vital research and has the mammoth task of educating our community and all Americans of the risk of breast cancer. Now, therefore, the Board of County Commissioners in Leon County do hereby proclaim October 2022 as Breast Cancer Awareness Month in Leon County and ask all citizens to join in this worthwhile cause to celebrate successes and memorialize lost battles. And this is signed by the Chair of the Leon County Board of County Commissioners, Mr. Bill Proctor. And I present this to the two of you. Okay, thank you. We want to do a photo op. Let's see. This is the copy. All right. So how do we go this way? Hold on, hold on, uh, camera people. Everybody not in the picture yet. I think we got another uh, fact. Okay, hold on. <laughs> Are there any special events for the month of October that uh, our community needs to be informed of, or is there a website that uh, citizens might go to? to obtain additional information about breast cancer awareness. Uh, is there anything that either of you can share? It's on the Department of Health website, all of the events that we have that we're sponsoring for the month. Okay. So citizens of our community, please note that our uh, county's health director indicates that on the county, Leon County's health department's website, there is additional information for activities, uh, data, and facts for you to uh, obtain. Thank you all so very much. Hello, um, thank you so much for this opportunity and for such a beautiful um, arrangement that's here. We are very proud of the work that we're able to do here in Leon County. We're able to span to the other smaller rural counties as well. Early detection is key and that's what we do and talk about all day. If you know anyone who does not have insurance that needs a mammogram, our program is available for women ages 50 to 64, any woman that has any issues, problems, or concerns with her breast. Our direct number is 850-404-6404. Thank you.
Thank you. Our next item calls for recognition of um, Mrs. Patricia Proctor, who is my mother, and uh, an 85th birthday uh, proclamation. Uh, that proclamation will be shared on Saturday at a uh, uh, 85th birthday uh, celebration. And uh, Mr. Thompson, you know I want you to be there. And she wants you to be there at that gathering. Then um, our next item is a recognition of Mr. George Godfather Thompson for the 49 years of service with FAMU Rattlers Athletics. And I'll come down to that. I'm just ugly. I ain't gonna bite. <laughs> I might strike. All right. Community, uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, Mr. Thompson, I've known all my life. Uh, the impact of him upon players, uh, you hear it at the FAMU Hall of Fame induction. Uh, while he was not officially a coach at FAMU, um, he was long regarded as power behind the throne. And um, his voice carried much weight throughout FAMU athletics. Uh, my first football uniform, uh, Mr. Thompson bought for me and I believe I was in first grade, and um, I was number two. And you got a little boy's uniform for Teddy. Teddy was number one. And off that uniform, I became um, the mascot for FAMU High, and Teddy became mascot for the FAMU Rattlers. And you couldn't tell us we were not on the Green Bay Packers. We just knew it was somebody. Ms. Thompson, uh, this proclamation reads, whereas George Thompson, after graduating from Florida M. University in 1954 with a degree in physical education and health, he stayed close to the school, working in various capacities. Thompson's primary duty was serving as the equipment manager. And whereas his work with FAMU Athletics and Coach Jake Gaither went beyond football, Consequentially, Thompson and Gaither develop a deep friendship. When Gaither traveled for speaking engagements and recruiting trips, standing alongside him was Thompson. And whereas throughout his career, Thompson dealt with all types of personalities across FAMU's landscape. However, one thing remained the same. He demanded punctuality from all he came in contact with. And whereas Thompson was a stickler for being on time, tardiness brought about big penalties. This rule was also applicably extended to family members. You know about that, Tawana? We didn't know that. You did come home on time. That <laughs> <laughs> penalty is on the family members. The first person I fired was my son, Teddy, said Thompson. Have you forgiven him yet? <laughs> okay. Whereas Thompson lived under Jim Crow laws, he didn't participate in marches against segregation. Those absurd laws instill Thompson with a strong sense of black pride, economics, and cultural awareness. And whereas George Godfather Thompson is a walking time capsule of FAMU athletics history. And whereas George has received massive accolades, the Godfather remains genuine, brutally honest, and faithful to all things FAMU. And whereas Thompson was born, you want me to read this part on September 1. 1927 in Melbourne, Florida, and is 95 years young. And to this day, Thompson is still unsure as to how he earned the name Godfather. Nevertheless, whenever the moniker is uttered, every rattler knows it's a phrase of reverence to the iconic George Thompson, Jr. Now, therefore, we, the Leon County Board of County Commissioners, do honor George Godfather Thompson, dated this 11th day of October 2022, Mr. Thompson is signed by all seven members of the Leon County Board of County Commissioners, and it is attested to by our administrator. We thank you, we love you, and God bless you. 95 years young, I'm intending to make 96 or 7, and you've shown me the way I'm going to follow your tracks. Well, Scott, how you doing? Come on and say something, Mr. Thompson.
Godfather. Before the Godfather, this was the Godfather. Well, I'm honored to be here, for one thing, and to make a proclamation. I'm granted, I'm thankful, real thankful. And I work real hard to do nothing. Because <laughs> I put everybody else to work that work with me. And all the time that I've worked here at FAMU and FAMU High and any place, anything I could have somebody with, I'm always ready to do it. This, I'm grateful to you and all the people of God. Amen. Amen. Good, good, good. Um, Vince, I think some years ago I told you a uh, story you heard, Mr. Thompson to say that he focused on trying to do uh, nothing. And uh, actually, my father uh, was the pool, family pool operator and kept the water and the right amount of chlorine and so forth. So my dad says that Thompson came to work and um, said, you know, Proctor, uh, this morning I had decided when I got to work that I wasn't going to do a damn thing today. And now that I'm here, I ain't going to even do that. And, and he left. <laughs> we love this family. We love Tawana. Uh, Tola. This is Tola Thompson's daddy. Teddy Thompson's father. And uh, what he has meant to our community. Uh, and probably the, the last uh, of the uh, uh, revered coaches of the 60s, 50s um, is Mr. George Thompson. Uh, the county is proud of you, Mr. Thompson, and we wish you Godspeed, many more years of successful uh, life. To God be the glory. What's next on that? Mr. Chairman, was that the first proclamation you gave away today? Sir? Was that the first proclamation? Uh, no, sir. That was uh, Mr. Godfather. All right. Um, if the proclamation has been given away from Breast Cancer Awareness Month, Mr. Chairman, then we're on the citizens to be heard on the agenda items. No, no, no. I think Commissioner Dozier may have had an item. It's not. Oh, cool. Okay. No, right. sir. It was removed from the, from the agenda. Very good. Let's keep me on track here. Yeah, yes, sir. Amen. Mr. Administrator. If I may, just a moment. Yes, ma'am. Um, that proclamation was for... Um, one of our newest Eagle Scouts, mm -hmm. Isabella um, Augustine. Yes, ma'am. And uh, appreciate all of you signing the proclamation. We will give that to her at her court of honor. She um, takes precedent, of course, but she had class today at FSU, so wasn't able to join us. Um, but thank you for mentioning that. Thank you. Mr. Administrator, any items to be, uh, any citizens to be heard on agenda items? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have one speaker card in, uh, Mr. Max Epstein. Mr. Epstein, name and address for, your, for the record, please, sir. Is he, is he virtual? Okay. Name and address for the record, please, sir. Mr. Chairman, I hand it back over to you. Yes, sir. Mr. Epstein, please state your name and address for our records. This is Max Epstein, 1001 San Luis Road. Um, I'm pretty sure there was supposed to be at least one virtual speaker. I know there are a couple others that may try to meet the end of this meeting. They couldn't make it right now. But I'm here to speak about the Fort Braden Oak tree. Um, I was able to meet with the folks uh, down in Fort Braden. There are about 250 people in this group who are very concerned about this tree coming down. I know the county's been working with Duke Energy, which is great. Uh, my question kind of is, how did we get here? Um, and I'd like to request a status update or an overview of our local tree ordinance, like you have one that's coming up later on in the agenda item here of what our tree ordinances actually do. Because even to me, it's a little confusing. And when you have a tree like this that is the size it is, the, has the history, the cultural significance, 
um, and also the health of the tree, people kind of expect that they're going to be protected. And I had people coming to me and looking at the code, and it says protected tree. But that's not really the case. It's protected until you get a permit to take the tree down. Um, the city is also in the progress and in the process of uh, looking and reviewing its tree ordinance. So this, I think, would be a good time to take a look at it. But this is not just one person. You know, it's not just environmentalists. It's not just one neighborhood. People are concerned about development and how it's going to affect them. And I know this is a little different because it's, you know, Duke Energy. But, um, you know, I think that we should be protecting our natural environment. Um, so, you know, I was out there on Saturday, people driving up and down, honking their horns to protect this. Uh, this tree's even on the community center's um, sign. The tree is right there. People have been had weddings under this tree. And this was actually Le Leon County property. So was there an agreement that Leon County came to for this, to take this tree down? Are there extra protections for it because it's a county owned? Um, is the county receiving money for this because folks uh, earlier on saying that they're getting paid up to $40,000 by Duke to take down some trees and for the right of way? Um, I just want you to know how important this tree is to the people of Fort Braden. And I think it is important for us to take a look at our ordinances to make sure that this won't happen again. Um, you know, I keep coming here a lot. You won't have to see me anymore if we kind of take a look at these ordinances and make sure that they're um, working correctly. I know they're also concerned about the name change. Um, they'd like to see the Fort Braden Community Center stay the Fort Braden or Community Center. I think there's a way to honor, honor Jimbo um, that maybe is not changing the name of the Community Center. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Ms. Epstein, are there other speakers? We have one more speaker card in, Stanley Sims. Mr. Sims? Okay, you get a chance. Mr. Sims, let's see if you can get an ovation. He's getting ready to turn on the booth. Okay. All right. Clap in advance. You may Good wait. afternoon, everyone. I'm Stanley Sims. These are my cheerleaders that are with me here today. I'm at 1320 Avondale Way. First, I want to share with you the glorious news that I've, I am currently seeking the office of the president of the Tallahassee branch of the NAACP. And what brings me here today is oftentimes when we have conversations about saving a tree, some people don't get the context of the conversation. It's not just saving a tree. It's saving a tree that means something to the people in that community. And then, you know, I, I look at my house. I've got stuff that's important to me, but may not be important to the other people. But it has sentimental values. And I think the people are saying respect the sentimental values of that tree. And not only... I'm really concerned about how we handle that because Commissioner Welch, where that tree sit, that's the new economic boom center. In five years, we're going to see so much economic growth in your area. Do we have the right policies and procedures, ordinance, so that Highway 20, five years from now, we won't have septic tank problems like we had Thomasville Road. We won't have polluted swamps like we got on there. We need to be proactive. We know that that area is our next area of economic boom. And these areas of trees, septic tanks, water treatment, ask yourself, why is it that there is not one canopy road on the south side? Not one. You notice that? But we love our trees, but we love our trees and we protect our trees on the north side of town. 
It's time to spread the love. And we can start with this beautiful tree. My name is Stanley Sims, and I'm running to be your next president for the Tallahassee branch. Come with me. Let us all. We win together. Win. Clap. Boom shakalaka. I see y'all later. Mr. Sims, I want to thank you, uh, uh, Vice Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll wait till the next part. I know we don't have any speakers specifically to um, none agenda items. So. Very good. Um, commissioners, we've completed our run of citizens. Is that right, Mr. Administrator? That's correct. Uh, that being the case, is there a motion for consent? We have a motion. Mr. Chairman, there's one item that's been pulled from consent. Okay, which, which item? Number 20. Item number 20. Uh, we have a motion for consent, with the exception of item 20. Uh, all in favor of the motion, uh, please say aye. Oppose the same sign. It carries unanimously. Um, item number 20, Mr. Mishri. Mr. Chairman, I, I need to state the reasons for my uh, uh, abstention from number 20. Yes, sir. Uh, my wife is an independent contractor with the Williams Group, which is brokered by Superior Realty Group. My wife does not have contracts in the Rivers Landing development for which she would receive compensation. Thus, I do not believe a conflict exists. However, another realtor with the brokerage is currently negotiating a contract for a property within this development. For this reason, I will recuse myself based upon the appearance of a conflict pursuant to Section 286.012 Florida Statutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Madam County Attorney, you're comfortable uh, with the stated position of Commissioner Minor? I am. The recusal is proper. Okay. All right, we have a motion by the Vice Chair. The staff's recommendation on item 20 is there a second. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. It passes unanimously as well. Pardon? Okay, okay. Uh, Vice Chairman, be recognized. Thank you. Uh, during the comments made earlier, there was a, was a request made specifically for a staff report or report on our local tree ordinance. I'm not necessarily asking for an agenda item, um, Mr. Administrator, but maybe just a report, just a refresher on uh, what our ordinance currently are. Is just the only thing I'm looking for here, so let's so we can just uh, have a look at it. That work? Yes. Do you need a motion for that? All right. Um, status report that we uh, to come back of the local Leon County tree ordinance that we have in place now for us to review as a, as a simple status report. Is that to just more specific? Is that to understand the statute in, in, in what way um, what would be reviewing the true um, ordinance? well actually I mean it could it could simply just be an email I mean if, if I, I just want to review the ordinance I just want to see what we have in place right now and so I didn't know if we want to do that as a statute or just us just getting back the ordinance from the uh, email of the ordinance uh, for us to see from the administrator but that's you know uh, I, mean, I could take it either way okay uh, vice chair desires that we uh, do we need a motion just to see it, uh, Madam Attorney? Information? If, so if it's something that's going to come back as a status report that would require, even though this is not during commissioner discussion time, a unanimous uh, vote. Um, otherwise, if it's just an email update, I think just as long as the board is in favor of that, then that's fine. Okay. Mr. Chair? Yes, Commissioner Dozier. Um, I think a review of the ordinance, I mean, a, an email to get started is yeah. probably sufficient. Um, I would suggest looking at what the city's doing with their ordinance since they are in review. I'm not sure, Mr. County Administrator, if they, um, I think they've produced some updates um, that may be helpful as well. Mm. That's actually pretty good. Uh, Cart before horse thing, so. I'm sorry. Email, not I would send yeah. the motion. Give us an email, and then, Mr. Administrator, if you could just keep us up to date on what the city is doing with their ordinance, uh, we, we can go from there. That's a good, that's a good suggestion, Commissioner. I was just going to add to that. Thank you. Um, I, I think that is the appropriate first step. Yeah. Um, I hear more about trees within the city limits in mm -hmm. their growth management process than the county. This is a unique circumstance, though, and... Um, I'm not sure if there's anything specific or what, you know, if we can lean into this issue any more than we already, or 
have with staff and other things, just in the typical process. I don't know, Ms. County Administrator, if we could get a status update on specifically this tree in question. Um, we we know, well, some of us have, have uh, dealt with transmission lines and other things. I mean, the utility companies have a lot of power to do what they want to do, unfortunately. Um, but it would be good to find out what is happening and um, dig in from our staff perspective and dig into that a little bit more as well. Thank you. Uh, that, that'll suffice it. I mean, so I was saying the most just ask for an email and just keep us up to date with the city's doing. I mean, my, my hopes are with respect to trees and whatnot that we look at uh, shrubs and bushes at the corners, intersections. Uh, don't we have some setback uh, that you can see? And um, my concern with sight lines at corners and intersections, uh, I would love to see what that rule, if any, that we have, and um, how do we enforce um, the sight lines at corners. Um, I, hope, I hope we could highlight that part. Um, any other comments, input, commissioners? Okay. Um, Here none. Um, we don't need a motion or a vote on that. Okay. Very, very good. Moving right along now to our general business, Ms. County Administrator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we're on item number 26, which is a status report uh, on best practices, best management practices for Lake Munson. Commissioners, the item before you, uh, again, provides a status update, um, as it says here in the item, on the natural conditions and past contamination of Lake Munson, the progress made on water quality. Uh, as a result of cooperative actions, strategic investments, and prioritization of capital projects, present-day challenges, best management practices for ongoing and planned enhancements of Lake Munson. Um, the item uh, seeks the board's approval of what we're calling an action plan for Lake Munson, uh, which includes uh, immediate and temporary uh, drawdown of the water level to coincide uh, with enhanced water quality monitoring, uh, aerial topography surveys. Um, it also includes long-term strategies uh, to supplement the state's in-lake restoration activities uh, and provides higher level of services uh, service to county residents, uh, including um, the uses of, of treatments uh, for uh, algal blooms, uh, uh, implementing uh, an invasive management program, uh, ongoing engagement over the next two years to evaluate the lake's response to the drawdown, and of course, we're recommending here regular updates be provided uh, to the board uh, every six months, given, again, sort of the comprehensive nature uh, of all this. Uh, the item also includes commissioners, as you know, uh, at your direction, uh, uh, we have engaged with the work group uh, on this uh, issue. Uh, and the item before you presents uh, an update uh, on that and specific responses to to uh, all of the work group's recommendations. Uh, happy to provide that to you today. Uh, and um, and with that, I think I'll hand it off to uh, Mr. Morris to, to begin a, a brief presentation that we have. Just a point of information. Yep. Uh, I think Commissioner Cummings and Commissioner Maddox and myself, we've got somewhat of a preview at the uh, recent town hall meeting down in, uh, in Woodville. And uh, since that meeting, uh, Mr. Administrator, um, I'm not sure how much time you want to spend on this item, but it seems pretty comprehensive. But I think I saw data that I didn't, I couldn't remember before of the amount of money that have been spent over the last, and um, when we met in Woodville, uh, that amount um, has, has not. Could you just share sure. with the board some of the synopsis as well as the volume of um, investment we've made. Sure. Um, and part, part of this, again, is to clarify uh, the county's long-term work on, on Lake Munson. We readily acknowledge you'll always find within the first couple of words of anything that we write on Lake Munson is acknowledgement of historical, historical contamination of Lake Munson. Uh, but we also have to put due emphasis on uh, three decades of, of very intensive uh, investment in that area, uh, totaling uh, in terms of what's been done, what's being done, and what's planned, about $285 million. Uh, in addition to um, extensive uh, uh, regulatory um, uh, actions that have been taken, that have been put in place, policies that have been put in, put in place, 
best management practices that have been and continue to be put in place. And so again, it's important to acknowledge uh, this as well. And so um, uh, again, uh, Commissioner Proctor, when we land uh, on this presentation, the last slide that will come up is sort of a summary of that. And, and we'll, we'll be sure to, to hit on that. And, and, and let me also just say too that that is not in any way to suggest that uh, that these efforts are exhaustive or, or in any way enough. Uh, certainly we're not suggesting uh, that. Uh, in fact, what it does is demonstrates the county's commitment uh, to Lake Munson uh, again now and, and in the future. So uh, with that, Ken, I'll hand it off to you. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, commissioners. Anna Padilla and I are going to just give you a quick presentation um, on, on why we're here today to talk about Lake Munson and cover your agenda materials. I know you've got a lot in front of you in terms of the agenda materials. We've got about a dozen slides or so, so we'll, we'll go through it pretty quickly. But we're going to cover what's going on with the lake right now. Um, a little bit about the, the planned drawdown and the anticipated benefits, which will, are expected to occur immediately. And the long-term recommended actions for the county to take on a, a greater role in the lake management. Um, that, that's something where... The county has historically been focused on upstream improvements, nearby improvements. As a state managed water body, we understand state's resources are limited as well, but we think there's certain steps uh, we can take to help improve uh, the residents' experience with the lake. Uh, so I want to start uh, by just providing a refresher again of how we got here today and look back on the intentional strategies and investment that have been made over the last 30 years, not just by the county, but also Blueprint and the city as well. And so really this starts uh, most recently with the changing conditions on, on Lake Munson this summer. Going back to May, you've had reports of algal blooms. Shortly thereafter, there were reports of fish kills. And then through staff observations going out to the lake, we saw uh, an abundance of hydrilla vegetation growing and, and realized there was a need for immediate action. Going back to the board's meeting last month, the county administrator advised commissioners that we planned on bringing an item back tonight to talk about the need for the drawdown and, and the anticipated benefits, but also we would examine other best management practices and opportunities for the county to improve the lake. At that time, last month, you already had in hand a list of 10 requests from uh, what I'll call a work group, uh, residents of Lake Munson and, and other stakeholders, 10 written requests, and, and you all directed staff to meet with this work group and, and to specifically include in the agenda materials responses to their specific requests. So we certainly did that uh, in, in, the, in the weeks following your last board meeting in September. And uh, we convened the work group. We met for about uh, five hours over the course of two meetings. Uh, the work group was well represented, about six to eight, six to nine people each meeting. Uh, and we brought in our technical experts from different county departments. We brought in Blueprint. We brought in representatives from state agencies and a member of our science advisory committee. We wanted everybody in the room, as we could, to focus on these issues. It's also important to point out that the recommendations in your agenda materials include input from the work group. Now, let me be very clear. Everything that they wanted is not included in the recommendations. There are some things we disagree with, and we specifically articulate that throughout the agenda item, where there are areas of disagreement and, and why. So you'll see that throughout the course of the agenda materials. And then finally, just the specific Q&A, the response to the 10 written questions, uh, that's also in your agenda item. It starts on page 23. Uh, and then other parts of it are, again, repeated throughout the agenda item as to why we are doing something, why we're not recommending something, and so on. So to start, I just want to give you a, an overview of the Lake Munson Basin. I'll show you a map in a few minutes and a couple slides, but 32,000 acres. Uh, it includes, uh, it's mostly within the city limits, but it's also part of the Wakulla Springs primary focus area. That's important to keep in mind. So Lake Munson's a state-managed water body. It's within the Wakulla Springs primary focus area. It's important because 
the state sets the water quality standards for the lake. What are the appropriate nutrient levels? And that's what we test for on a quarterly basis to measure and see where we are. It's also important to note the Wakulla Springs focus area because it helps us access funding for a lot of the projects that we've done in recent years that we're doing right now, one that's on your consent agenda tonight, and going forward. We've been able to leverage state funding because of Lake Munson's location in the Springs area. Another important thing to point out with the basin is Lake Henrietta and Munson Slough. Most of the runoff, most of the water within the Lake Munson Basin is going through these two different facilities. Munson Slough just being a channel going into the lake. Lake Henrietta, in quotes, because it's a constructed stormwater facility. It was built for the intentional purpose and design of supporting and cleaning water before it gets to Lake Munson. Uh, we're anticipating a federal grant early next year to go in and dredge Lake Munson. Again, because it's designed to do that. We call it a lake. We know it gets confusing, but it's it's actually a point of information. Henrietta. I'm sorry, I said Lake Munson. Oh, I'm sorry. Lake Henrietta. I apologize. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so the Wait, the, you said you said stop right there. Um, one of the questions I've been asked most is and maybe you can help answer it for me. Is why dredge Henrietta, but not Munson? Because it's designed for that. It it allows for controls of limiting the 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 water and the sediment from going downstream. But I think we're going to get okay. more to your question okay. in a few minutes Thank you. with Anna. So no, specifically, the the lake itself. County administrator referenced earlier it the the chronic water quality issues, ecological problems. In 2013, the state established water quality standards for nutrient levels. Uh, you've got an attachment in your, in your materials. It's a few bar graphs. It tells you a few things. One, in the last few years, it almost looks like falling off a cliff. The nitrogen levels, the phosphorate levels have really come down over the last five, six years. Since 2017, the nitrogen levels have actually been below the state standard. And today, after five or six years of decline, the phosphorus levels are right at the standard. They're, they're sort of dancing with the, the state limits. Some, some testing shows it right above, some right below. Uh, it's right there, and it just demonstrates a lot of the progress that's been made in the water quality. And we attribute that to all of the investments that have been made upstream over the years. So you, you, you do a literature review when you dive into a project this big. And we went back to the 1991 stormwater plan uh, that was impaneled by the Water Management District. And then soon after followed by the county commission putting together an action plan. The difference between the two, the stormwater plan focused on the basin, like the last slide, the, the 94 Lake Munson plan focused on the lake itself. And so they had some overlapping strategies, if you will. The, the stormwater plan focused on both capital improvements. How can we control flooding? How can we control water quality? Uh, what, what retention ponds can we put in? And then it also focused on non-structural recommendations, uh, the preservation of wetlands, the restoration of wetlands. Uh, land use issues, regulatory issues. How can we stop pollutants from getting into the water stream? By 1994, just a few years later, when the county commission impaneled a 12-member body of technical experts, state agencies, private citizens, uh, focusing more so on the, the in-lake enhancements, it resulted essentially in, in three strategies. The watershed management, which are all the structural and non-structural improvements, the in-lake restoration, and then what they called community action. And that was always anticipated to be a latter phase. It was anticipated to focus on public education and the individual and their pollutants and how you can reduce your pollutants that, that harm our natural resources. Local government since that time, last 30 years, has focused on upstream improvements. And I'm going to show you the, the map and the listing of projects that are referenced throughout your agenda item. Um, our, our focus has been we want the water 
that's coming into Lake Munson to be as clean as it can, and that will improve the overall quality of Lake Munson. And the data proves that. The bar graphs I referenced earlier, they show you that the, the water going into the lake is much cleaner than the water in the lake. So to date, uh, reflecting back on 30 years uh, and some of the ongoing projects and projects in the next five years, we accounted about $285 million of investments between the city, the county, and Blueprint. So I referenced the basin earlier. This gives you a little perspective of, again, how big it is. The green line shows you the map of the basin. And then 25 of the projects throughout the basin that have focused on enhancing water quality. Down here at the bottom, you've got the actual lake itself. And you've got uh, number four here, which is the, um, the new Northeast Lake Munson sewer project, which was on your consent agenda tonight. So this just gives you an idea of all the different projects that came out of both the stormwater plans and the 94 action plan. Um, I, I don't want anybody to think the plans sat on a shelf. They intentionally guided our community strategy and investments over the years to enhance Lake Munson. But capital improvements obviously aren't the only thing we can do to enhance water quality. Uh, regulatory measures are a big part of that. Uh, for new development, the county utilizes the Land Development Code, the Environmental Management Act, and, and, and we do that to enforce you know, how stormwater is treated on site, to prohibit it from going off site. We have green space requirements and open space requirements, both for subdivision and, and lake protection areas. Outside of new development, we have shoreline setbacks, so people aren't mowing their, their lawn all the way down to the, to the shoreline. We, we require a 15-foot vegetative buffer to, uh, to keep you know, fertilizers and, and uh, other treatments that you'd put on your lawn off the lake, away from the lake, 15 feet. The board also adopted and, and recently revised about 18 months ago its fertilizer ordinance based on a state model. And simply put, that it just minimizes the excess fertilizer runoff that goes into our waterways. The, the board decided to go a little bit further than the state model. And it, the ordinance today includes a fertilizer timeout, which prohibits the use of fertilizer ahead of forecasted storms that are anticipated to provide so much rain. Again, if you get a lot of rain on your lawn, the water is going to run downstream. And so we, we prohibit new applications of fertilizer 24 hours in advance. And this model ordinance also, uh, it's a regulatory measure that the county has, it's part of your, your toolkit, but it also aligns a little bit with the, the community action component or strategy of the 94 action plan because, again, it has that focus on the individual. Right? I know that I can't fertilize my yard uh, you know, right before a storm. And so that being the, the, the third strategy, again, just to demonstrate how we've been intentional about our investments over the years, uh, I, I look back to uh, the Springs Improvement Plan Agreement that the board approved in 2018, really first of its kind. The Florida Department of Environmental Protection was looking to make investments uh, to protect springs. And so they're looking for water quality projects they're trying to find local governments with the resources to match for projects. And at that time, 2018, we had just um, successfully did the early passage of the sales tax. So that provided a dedicated revenue source for the county to enter into this agreement with the state. Really, first of its kind, multi-year funding agreement. Uh, both parties committed $32 million each through 2024. Uh, and, and there's lots of examples of projects right now. The Northeast Lake Munson Sewer Project, it's over $12 million. It's going to serve 220 parcels. And then you've got two septic tank upgrade and incentive programs also available. With that, Commissioners, I'm going to hand it off to Anna. She's going to give you the deep dive more on the, the recent algal blooms, how they happen, why they happen, 
and then some of the uh, some of the recommended action steps going forward, obviously including the the drawdown and the anticipated benefits. C commissioners, uh, before Anna steps up, are there any questions that you might have? Because this is a, a lot to uh, to um, carry forward. If you got to answer a question that you want to ask in this category of the presentation, hearing none, Anna, if you would. Hey, thank you, commissioners. So before I dive into Lake Munson, um, let's talk first a little bit about algal blooms. Algae is naturally occurring. Uh, blooms occur when the algae rapidly grows. And it really is sparked by weather conditions, so warm days, lack of rainfall, um, and then conditions of the lake. So Lake Munson, for example, that's very shallow, doesn't have a lot of water flow. It's more susceptible to uh, algae blooms. Not all algae is toxic. And the recommendations are just to use caution and good judgment around, um, around the algae and avoid contact with the water if there's a bloom that's been observed. So when an algal bloom is observed, it gets reported to DEP. DEP visits the water body, observes the bloom, photographs it, logs it into their database. They collect water samples. Those water samples are then tested by the DEP lab. Um, and the, the lab results are provided to the Florida Department of Health who analyzes the results and then works with the Leon County Health Department to determine any necessary health warnings, um, such as boat ramp closures, um, public news release advisories, and provides guidance to the city and county on what to do based on uh, what those lab results said. When there's fish kills reported, those get reported to the, fish, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. They log it in their system. Um, they document the conditions. If it's warranted, they visit the site. If they feel like it's needed, DEP will go out and send us, uh, collect a water quality sample and analyze it in their lab. Um, and they just keep track of it. And then they coordinate with the county on the fish kills. And we maintain a database of those as well. So this summer, on May 25th, you'll remember that DOH Leon issued a health alert for an algal bloom on Lake Munson with toxins. Uh, and the county closed the boat ramp just in advance of Memorial Day weekend. This uh, health alert was then lifted by DOH Leon on July 21st when toxins were no longer detected in the water. Uh, later that summer, we had a fish kill that was reported to FWC, about 100 fish um, off the eastern bank of Lake Munson. That occurred on August 27th, and it was, it was caused by low dissolved oxygen. So the all of the aquatic vegetation in the water was using up all of the oxygen, so the fish didn't have enough oxygen really to survive. Uh, and then on August 30th, additional algal blooms were detected, but no toxins were, um, or al algal blooms were observed, but no toxins detected. And when staff were out about the same time at the end of August, we observed really an abundance of hydrilla in the lake, and it, it really had just taken over the lake. So Ken provided you with a history and a background of the lake. And in the item you read about the ongoing uh, best management practices that the county has done and will continue to do uh, in response to the challenges of the lake. And then we also discussed the additional recommended best practices moving forward. Um, so I will explain, in addition to what was provided in the item, just going a little bit further, expanding upon that. Um, we'll talk about the immediate drawdown of Lake Munson the ongoing and planned infrastructure projects, and the long-term lake management activities. Uh, and then, th so these rec recommendations for the lake, um, they really represent a holistic approach to lake management. They're based on proven management strategies and best management practices. Uh, and they really go above and beyond what the county has already done and will continue to do. And then finally, I'll provide some information on the plan next steps on how we're going to continue coordination with the work group and continue to keep you as the board informed on updates. So first, the immediate drawdown of the lake. We have a target start date of November 1st, but certainly if we can um, institute or implement that sooner, we absolutely will. We plan on drawing down the lake and having it dry for about three to five months. So that'll be in coordination with the uh, Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission and the Science Advisory Committee it really depends on what the weather does and how long, uh, how the lake responds to the drawdown as to how long we really want to keep it down. So the benefits of the drawdown is it provides an immediate mitigation for the algal blooms 
the nutrients in the sediment and the aquatic vegetation challenges that we've had. And it kills off the hydrilla and it allows us to more easily manage the hydrilla when we refill the lake. The drawdown also allow allows the sediments to compress and dry out and compact and they form a cap over the bottom of the lake bed that really prevents that nutrients from coming up out of the water. And there's also benefits to aquatic habitat as well. Um, reduces the density of the aquatic vegetation, um, increases the lake depth, and it provides good um, spawning material for fish. Um, we're also going to be implementing an enhanced water quality study. So this is in addition to what the county currently does. Um, as you all know, we have the water resources program. We quarterly sample on, on numerous lakes around the county. Uh, we provide an annual report, which we anticipate bringing back to you in December. Uh, and so this goes above and beyond that. And this program includes one initial sample prior to drawdown of the lake. So we really have information on what the lake, um, what the water quality of the lake is right now. We'll be sampling at four locations upstream of the lake um, and downstream of the lake. And then once we refill the lake, we will do monthly sampling for a period of two years after the drawdown. Um, and then that includes analysis of the data and a report as well. And so that's really going to determine the effects of the drawdown, how well it worked, what it did for the water quality. Um, and this is not, there's been a lot of talk about the point source sampling. This water quality study is not related to the point source sampling, which I'll discuss later. So another aspect of the enhanced monitoring is the aerial topographic survey. So this is two surveys uh, where a, an airplane flies over the lake and collects uh, data on the lake to determine what the elevation is in the lake. The first one will happen right after we draw the lake down so that we know what the conditions are before the drawdown or before the sediments compact. And then the second one will happen at, right before we refill the lake. So we can tell that difference of how much the sediments compacted during the drawdown. Um, it provides useful information on the effectiveness of the drawdown and the compaction of the sediment, as well as information on the depths of the lake right now. And it's really beneficial for evaluating in-lake uh, mitigation and management strategies in the future. And so the last component of this enhanced monitoring is that point source testing. So the item talked a bit uh, about the 2019 FGS study. So that was done by the Florida Geological Sur Survey which is a division of the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. So that FGS report and the Terracon report both concluded that the sediments are really tightly, or the, excuse me, the contaminants are really tightly stuck to that sediment and that it's not leaving the sediment and coming off into the water. The results of the report were discussed with DEP and no further testing recommendations were made. Um, based on results of the um, talk with the work group, we have uh, put a plan together to do water column testing, and this will validate the state and the Terracons report to say that the water, the contaminants are not polluting the water, contaminating the water, and really address the concerns of the work group uh, to show that the contamination, there's not contamination in the water causing algal blooms. So this will test for the same contaminants that were tested in the report. PCBs, you hear a lot about PCBs. There are other contaminants, heavy metals. Um, we are going to take one sampling event at four different locations. So one time we'll go out, collect samples at four locations. And in the very unlikely event that uh, elevated dissolved concentrations are found in the water, um, we will consult with DEP to develop a plan and bring that back to you for your review. Oh, that, sorry. Um, so next, the ongoing and planned infrastructure projects. So the decades, decades of inf upstream improvements, those don't stop. Attachment five in your item includes a figure of information and a timeline of all of the ongoing and future planned projects that we have. Two specific ongoing projects that are to continue reducing the sediment and trash upstream are the Blueprint 3DB Regional Stormwater Facility, which is 
uh, at the end of Capital Cascades Segment 3, right near Lake Alberta, Lake Alberta. And then Capital Cascades Trail Segment 4, which is currently in design with Blueprint. The county also has the upcoming Lake Henrietta Sediment Removal Project. And so, Commissioner Maddox, to answer your question, Lake Henrietta is a constructed stormwater facility. This project is going to remove sediment. It's different from Lake Munson in that it was designed and constructed to capture that sediment, to get in there and to remove that sediment. Where, where Lake Munson is a natural system, um, doesn't have the access, it's not, it's not meant to be dredged out all the time, whereas Lake Henrietta is. Um, Lake Henrietta, we can get all the way around it with equipment. Uh, the other thing that's beneficial about Lake Henrietta is we can, we can move the water around so that we don't send polluted water downstream. So Lake Munson, we really can only get in from the boat ramps and the dam side. The other side is Forest Service uh, land, so it's um, not, not doable, but more challenging. Uh, and it's, it's an online system, so all the water comes in and it goes out. And we don't have the ability, as we do in Lake Henrietta, to kind of move that water around and work in, in areas that aren't going to send polluted water downstream. Mr. Chair? Um, sure. I'm going to attempt to try to make it plain, and you tell me if, I, if I'm saying this correctly, okay? Um, Lake Henrietta is a stormwater facility that, was, that we created. Mm -hmm for the specific purpose of catching sediment, sediment and cleaning it out. That's correct. Um, Munson, Lake Munson is not such. Correct. All right. Explain just for the record what Lake Munson is versus Lake Henrietta. Yeah, so Lake Munson was originally a cypress swamp in the uh, 50s. 50s. Uh, it was dammed. The, the Lake Munson Dam was installed to create that impoundment and, and store the water up, changing it from the swamp to the open water lake system. It's still cypress lined. Uh, it's forest service, it's private property. We have the boat ramp on it and access at the dam. So Henrietta was built to be clean, built access to be clean. and all. Correct. All right, thank you. So the Lake Henrietta sed Sediment Removal Project will remove sediment from Lake Henrietta from the facility so that it can function as it was designed, restore it to back to the original uh, immediately post-construction conditions. And that'll ultimately improve the water quality in Lake Munson and further reduce the sediment uh, going to Lake Munson. Question. So while the lake is drawn down, Henrietta will be uh, dredged during that time? No, it will not. Um, it'll be after the lake is refilled, most likely. Uh, we have to still design and put plans together for the Lake Henrietta sediment. So we lake. draw Lake Munson down and we'll refill it with the sediments that are currently in the bottom of Henrietta. <clears throat> um, is that what you're saying? No, no, not at all. Um, the water that's coming into Lake Henrietta will come into Lake Henrietta. It'll continue to flow through Lake Henrietta down Munson Slough into Lake Munson and, and form just a little channel through the lake where it goes out through the day. Will we not optimize water flowing from Lake Henrietta if we drained it while simultaneously, if we dredged Henrietta while simultaneously we have drained down uh, Lake Munson? That would be ideal, but unfortunately due to funding and design and just the timing of the project, we're not in a position to be able to implement, implement the Lake Henrietta project at the same time as the drawdown. We don't want to wait on the drawdown because it's optimal to do it in the winter. So we really want to get started. Vice Chair, thank you. This might be not a good question, but my teacher always told me there's no such thing as a bad question. Um, <laughs> Commissioner Dozier, don't laugh at me. Promise, promise won't laugh at me. Thank you, thank you. Um, why do we call stormwater facilities lakes? Um, to me, it, it gives off this connotation that it's one thing when all, when all actuality, you know, I mean, it's really built in a way to help us deal with runoff, right? Um, just if you, if, you, if you have an answer, great. If you don't, I get it. But just trying to figure out there, I mean, because a, a lot of times, and, and I've said this in, in other means we've had it, it becomes a perception issue. When I hear lake, I think of something that I can swim in, fish in, 
throw it across, that kind of thing. Is that just me? Is, is it just me? But but I, I don't I don't think of stormwater facility that I can't do anything. Again, I think of when I hear lake, I think of amenity. I don't think of a kidney system to deal with runoff and other things. So many of these constructed projects are amenities, and, and that's part of the design feature as well. Lake Alberta, Lake Anita, these are stormwater facilities. So they're, they're, they attract people to, to enjoy uh, and, and, and be around. They, they're converted someone into recreational spaces, uh, but they're actually performing an important function for downstream water bodies like Lake Munson. Okay. Commissioner Dozier. Um, yes, I, I agree with your description, Ken, that, I mean, the ones we call lakes, uh, the stormwater facilities that we call lakes, they do function in a dual capacity, you know, as recreational areas. But, Commissioner Maddox, Mr. Vice Chair, I think you bring up a very good point that, um, if you all remember, we just, we had an issue many months ago um, with uh, Pedrick Pond next door to the Eastside Library, and we put up signs saying, don't eat the fish. This is a stormwater facility. Is that correct, Mr. County Administrator? Remember that correctly? So being more descriptive, um, I mean, you know, hopefully people read signs, things like that, but really understanding what these water bodies are functioning for um, and how they're helping our community that may be an interesting question to explore in the future. Um, the other thing I'd say is I think this is more complicated than just we, we name recreational areas um, that double as stormwater ponds, lakes. If we think about, um, I don't know, the chain of Killarne Lakes comes to mind, other places like that, we, we have used our lake systems as treatment facilities for stormwaters historically. We're doing a lot of mitigation going back. We're cleaning those things up. Um, and I don't want to say the Clarn Lakes are, are that way, but it, this gets even more complicated as we start to drill down until, into old agricultural lakes. I mean, there, there's a lot of different layers to this. So I think you've asked a very good question and appreciate you bringing it up because you're not the only person who thinks that way. And we certainly, particularly for health reasons, don't want to leave the wrong impression. But understanding the benefit of the stormwater filtration system um, as we get to a more net, more what should be a more natural environment, that could certainly be something good to lift up for our community in the future. Yeah, I'm guessing uh, I need a stormwater facility just isn't sexy enough for people. They probably wouldn't like it, but... It, it definitely would, for me anyway, it would give definition to to a freshwater lake versus a stormwater facility. And I'm not I'm not saying we change anything we've done for years. I'm just I'm just saying a lot of times perception becomes an issue because people expect a certain thing when you call it a certain thing. Uh, even even with Munson, as you, as we call it, uh, you said it, it started as a swamp. Now it's a lake. Mm -hmm. Is it expected to have a certain type of use? Uh, and, and even from the folks I've heard over there, they've told me that it's expected to be able to fish, swim, you know, boat on uh, just by, by statewide level of, of, of lake that it actually is. So it's just, to me, I, I think, I mean, I, I don't know that this conversation changes anything. Maybe it's just me making a point just for the sake of making a point. But perception of what you call something does become what people expect it to be. Uh, even if you put a sign out to say, that this is a stormwater facility, don't fish, don't swim, you know, that kind of thing. People are just gonna say, okay, it's a pond, it's a lake. That's what you're calling it, it's a pond, it's a lake. So yeah. I, I don't know how you I don't know how you deal with that problem. Um, but and I don't know that you deal with that problem, but I, I think I think it's a larger conversation, and maybe it's not a conversation because I don't think I don't even think there's anything we can do about it at this point. Thank you. Mr. Yeah. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Minor follow up by Commissioner Cummings. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. Um, I've got a couple of detailed questions to kind of clarify uh, some some discrepancies I've heard from my conversations with various people. And then I've got two uh, rather major things I want to bring up. Uh, first question, uh, one of the detailed questions, um, just to clarify, I, I think we've heard many times that not all cyanobacteria is toxic. But toxicity is not determined by the volume of an algal bloom, but rather the type of the algae within the bloom itself, correct? 
That's correct. The the microcystis, the cyanobacteria would submit a microcystis, which is a which is a toxin. So the algae gives off toxin, which creates it makes it be toxic. Algae. And even a trained person often can't tell the difference just by visually inspecting it. It has to be taken to a lab. That's correct. Okay. All right. But the key thing there is that it's it's not an algal bloom doesn't grow. It, it, the, it's not determined simply by the size of the bloom itself, but the type and the, the species of the, of, the, of the algae. Correct. Okay. Second question. Um, I, I, we've, I think many of us are very familiar with hydrilla and the highly invasive nature of it. I know that from Lake Jackson. Uh, it's an incredibly destructive plant, crowds out ecosystems, chokes an entire ecosystem out. Um, I, I've heard just in the last couple of days that, that hydrilla also, there's a, there might be a silver lining in it with regard to Lake Munson, and that it does possibly absorb some of the nutrients within the waters. Is that, does that make sense, or, or is, is, that, um, is that a credible assertion? Or? Yeah, that is the thought that, that the aquatic vegetation, and not just hydrilla, that root into the sediment do take up, they definitely take up the nutrients out of the sediment. Okay. But that being said, it's still advantageous for us to have the, the drawdown, kill the hydrilla, because of the invasive nature of it and, and, and such, right? That's correct, yeah. So we want to draw down, kill the hydrilla, uh, allow the native vegetation, try and give the native vegetation a chance to come back. We'd rather have the native vegetation in the lake than we would have the invasive exotic vegetation that in the lake. That makes sense. That makes sense. Okay, so I've got, now I've got two uh, major points I wanted to make. And I, I can't speak for everyone or anyone uh, at, this, at this dais except for myself, but I would venture to say that we aren't water, water quality experts except for maybe uh, Commissioner Dozier. Um, so what I've tried to do with it, knowing that I'm not a water quality expert, I, you know, I wasn't educated in, in college or anything like that, but I, what I've tried to do is, is you know, we hear discrepancies, uh, gaps from what um, uh, local citizens have been saying, some of whom have expertise, um, and then our county staff, which are very talented and have expertise as well, uh, and, and, and an incredible agenda item, very comprehensive here. So what I've been trying to do is, is try to find the major bones of contention and then trying to reconcile those bones of contention. Because once I'm able to resolve that to my satisfaction, that therein tells me where I need to go in terms of a county commissioner and where I go from my approach. So that being said, with regard to Lake Munson, it seems there are, there are two major bones of contention between the, the Lake Munson working group and, 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 and our county staff and, and, and what we've been hearing out from, um, from uh, folks within the county administration. One of them is the testing frequency. Um, the, the agenda item here goes into a lot of detail about how, and it, it, it mentions the working group's bone of contention here, which is that the working group says and believes that the, the testing should be done more frequently, and that point source testing sampling should be done to allow us to identify where in the upstream the, the main sources of pollution are coming from, it, both, both in terms of nutrients as well as PCBs, chromium, et cetera, all the other stuff. Um, I, we get into a little bit of detail on that in, in the agenda item, but can you talk about that discrepancy? Um, and, and how, why that discrepancy exists and, and what the county's position is on that. Because the, the county, according to the agenda item, uh, it says, you know, the, the testing that we have in the, in the action plan that we propose is sufficient. I want to interject that um, we, uh, I thought we would probably spend 45 minutes on this item. Uh, we've done that. And we have a mound of speaker cards and uh, possibly it looks like we're going to spend more like an hour and a half uh, on this one item. Uh, if, if, if a response, cursory response can be given uh, to Commissioner Miners, but if we could take the substantive aspect of his and put it in the back, and we get Commissioner Cummings and we try to keep this presentation going. Uh, but if you have a cursory response to the tension of the two groups uh, of which he's asking about, <clears throat> Um, I would appreciate um, a cursory um, yeah. response. Yeah, so I'll provide a brief answer, and if we need more later. Uh, so the county's position is we have the, the DEP FGS report. We have the Terracon report. The FGS report did say, you know, upstream sampling may help identify the source. The FGS, or the, excuse me, the Terracon report contradicted that information. We've consulted with DEP. The contaminants are old. And they have, could have come from anywhere. And there's significant development that has been done upstream. Lake Henrietta is capturing those and functioning as it should. Um, and so the system's really working as designed. The point of the one-time testing that we're doing is that 
anything that's there should be there in the one time test and so there's not need to do additional testing if we find things there we'll consult with dep and, and bring something back to you so you, you would say with the current uh, testing frequency approach that we've got you think that would identify contaminants um and that the variability from let's say one month to the other it isn't high enough to warrant more testing that's that's correct anything that's there now if it's gonna if it's there it's gonna be there now we're not gonna not find it now and find it a month later okay and in the water in right. the water yeah okay um, and, and the other the other main bone of contention is is with the drawdown with the sediment being exposed um, do we dredge or not do we remove the contaminants in the sediment itself or not um, you know I know the FGS study the the, the Terracon study says that it's there's no evidence to suggest that it's warranted um, but again, members of the working group, uh, people that have, been, that have been reached out to by the working group are saying, well, actually, it, is, it does make sense to dredge, as well as the, I think, the 90, 1994 Lake Munson action plans, or something like that, and 91, too. Um, what, uh, I think the action plan that we have here is, is, is with the drawdown. I think the working group is supporting the dry down. Um, for me, that, that bone of contention is going to remain because um, in, in trying to find out a way to reconcile that in some way, because there are, there are folks on one side that say we should be removing the sediments, and there are there's the FGS study, there's the the, the Terracon and, and, and county staff that say all things being equal, there there are costs and benefits of doing so, and and the the the, the damage, the potential damage toward dredging that up is actually more greater than the, the, the idea of leaving it there. Um, uh, to, to me, that's the other bone of contention between the working group and county staff, and and uh, I, I think we're taking a solid step here, and I, I think the working group. Not totally satisfied, but in large part thinks a drawdown is a positive step. Um, but for me personally, as we go through, we start the drawdown in November, it takes three to five months. Uh, I myself, personally, I'm going to be trying to figure out how I can reconcile that. You know, do we, do we dredge or not dredge? And, and what's the right answer there? Um, I know you've, you, you've done an incredible job on the agenda item explaining that. But for me, I'm, I'm going to continue trying to hear from the working group on what that what those considerations are to support dredging, because there, there are people that even today are, are suggesting that we do so. Um, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for your time. Uh, thanks for your time. I appreciate it and for all the work you've done on the agenda item. Thank Definitely you, want to hear from the uh, Thank you, uh, Commissioner public Minor. Too. Those were uh, extraordinary. Uh, though that is the heart of, um, I think, some of the contention point. I think it's a fair inquiry. Um, it's totally inbounds. Uh, it's the questions that uh, permeate the community. And um, certainly, I too will um, continue to have lingering thoughts. And by comparison, when Lake Jackson um, naturally uh, went down, our county commission acted quickly to dredge uh, its bottom. And uh, there were no objections to what the dredging would do uh, to its future. There's a different report here with Lake Munson that if you draw the water down and dredge its bottom, it portends an inevitable negative impact to its future. These are two different uh, uh, essences of what a dredging does. Lake Jackson, it was healthy. Lake Munson is unhealthy to do. I'm not a scientist either. Commissioner, uh, Cummings. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I think you and uh, Commissioner Minor basically hit on what I recognize as, I believe, the bone of contention between um, county staff recommendation and suggestions from from the SAC, you know, and, and citizens there in the Lake Munson area. And that is, you know, the dredging uh, issue. But beyond that, uh, I recognize, too, that it it could have some greater e exposure, uh, perhaps maybe a greater liability, uh, Madam County Attorney, for the county, because in the, in the report it indicated, well, first of all, if we dredge, we don't have a location to place the sediment, number one. Number two, we don't know what's, what's in that sediment, and I, I liken it to um, a substance where the notion is leave it alone, but once you tackle it, it might become airborne, it might become um, 
toxic, not just to the people around the lake, but there could be greater exposure if you try to transport it uh, some other place. And, and I believe that was some of the, the thinking and the analysis that staff did when the determination was made, look, let's just draw it down, see what happens. If the sediment gets embedded in the lake, it's not likely, and I think based on your testing now, you don't show where it, where it actually becomes part of the water. Am I, am I correct? That's correct, yeah. And, and, and with, the, uh, with the topographic, uh, the aerial survey, Will that tell you more about the conditions of the sediment, you think? Yes, that will. Uh, okay. So right now, if we, from my understanding, if we try to dredge, we're talking about an unknown that could be more harm, cause more harm, more harm than Yeah, you. and if I could, commissioners, on the next slide, we do go, we do talk about the dredging. So um, if I could continue on, and then if we don't adequately address, we can... Um, go further. So, uh, you know, go ahead. Excuse me. Are you finished? Well. Not, okay, continue. I'll see the, the yeah. Okay, you It finished. will probably answer some of the other questions or, okay. or some of the other concerns so that let, I have. Let's, let's zip our lips. We'll let staff finish. We'll try to get through uh, citizens and uh, try to bring this in after an hour of half of uh, discussion. So, expanding on what the county has already been doing, uh, as Ken mentioned, we do have um, the upstream infrastructure improvement projects uh, expanding to septic to sewer and addressing the nitrogen that's coming into the lake through those septic tanks. Uh, he mentioned the $12.1 million, $12 million Lake Munson, Northeast Lake Munson septic to sewer project, 220 properties immediately adjacent to the lake, and then the two septic upgrade programs that we have going on as well. And those are open to anybody in the Wakulla Springs primary focus area that are not in the septic to sewer project areas. So some of the long-term recommendations and actions is, um, and these will happen after we begin to refill the lake in the spring. And so these expand upon the county's role in managing Lake Munson and it expands on and enhance the existing pro programs that we have to provide a higher level of service uh, and continued coordination with state agencies. So one of these is an enhanced vegetation management program, and this expands upon the county's current program, which just includes spraying for invasives uh, in stormwater management facilities. And it will also supplement uh, FWC's current vegetation spraying program as well. And so this allows us to better manage that vegetation. We can more frequently treat, but in smaller areas. It, uh, it gives us the opportunity to not have to nuke the whole lake, which could potentially result in an algal bloom. And it also promotes that native vegetation growth that I had mentioned before. And so we also have um, the algal bloom management program. And this is a program to treat the algae as opposed to the one I just mentioned, which is for the in-lake vegetation. And uh, as you rem remember, the peroxide treatment was a big priority of that work group. Peroxide is really a new treatment type to Florida and the U.S. It is approved by the EPA for use. And in the last two years, it has been tested by two different water management districts. Because it's so new, it's not quite known what the long-term effects are. But the two, of, the two results, results from the two studies do look promising and do appear to be effective on treating the algal blooms. And so we've uh, included it in this action plan as well. Uh, and SAFA will continue to evaluate the peroxide and other treatment methods for algal blooms to ensure that there's no adverse impacts to the lake. And this program is really aimed at positioning the county so that next summer we are in a position to be able to treat those algal blooms should we need to. So the next component is the reoccurring drawdown schedule. And this reoccurring drawdowns are really an established management strategy and they're beneficial to the overall health of the lake especially in lakes that don't naturally experience drawdowns. We've uh, specified a planned drawdown cycle of every five to, five to 10 years. That exact period will be dependent on what the lake is doing in consultation with FWC and the Science Advisory Committee. And certainly if conditions of the lake warrant a drawdown sooner than that, we would bring an agenda item back to you all as we have done now to do a drawdown before that five year mark. And so um, the last one is that innovative technology exploration, and that's continued exploration of new and innovative methods for lake management 
and does include the in lake strategies. So dredging is not included in the plan. Uh, it's not included because there's concern about kicking up the sediments and one transporting them downstream. Because of that reoccurring drawdowns that we've had, we did one in the 90s, we did one in, um, or excuse me, early 2000s, we did one in 2010, that gradually compacts that sediment more and more. And so in the past, every time it rained, the sediment was kicked up, but we had the problem over and over again. With those routine drawdowns, it's really compacted that sediment. It's allowed the vegetation to root in and, and take. And so now when it rains, we don't have as much of a sediment um, kick up as we were. So if we were to go in and dredge, one of the concerns would be that now we're loosening that cap that we've worked hard to form. And every time it rains or every time we get a big flow that we're kicking that up and recirculating it around in the lake or washing it downstream um, as well. And then one of the other big concerns with Lake Munson are the karst features or the potential for sinkholes. And so, um, you know, dredging, we don't want to open up a sinkhole. The plan had been to dredge along the way. Um, and that was kind of where that 2019 FGS study came from, is that in order to dredge the lake, we needed to know what we had and how much of it we had so that we could determine what to do with it. And out of it, we found the PCBs. So now we're um, just kind of shifting focus, looking for new opportunities, and that's where this innovative technology exploration comes in is, um, you know, not proposing dredging now, but maybe in the future that is the best strategy. Maybe there's other, other strategies out there that are beneficial. Um, technology's changing fast, there's a lot going on. What's best for the lake now may not be the best for the lake in the future. Um, and so we'll continue to look at that. So do we know where the sinkhole is? We do, that was part of the FGS study. So, was so if we stay 50 yards from the sinkhole, maybe that wouldn't interrupt the sinkhole. I'm saying if you 332 acres. There's a lot of sinkholes. Oh, so we only know where a few of them are. They're, yeah, they're all over. We, we did survey the whole lake bottom, so we, okay. we know they're, they are all over. Okay, so it's Swiss, Swiss cheese bottom, okay. It is a Swiss cheese, yeah. So next steps moving forward, um, staff will continue to present the annual quality water report to the SAC and to the board for review. Um, as I mentioned, we anticipate that coming back to you in December. Staff will continue to monitor the lake uh, water quality of the lake and prevent, uh, um, will provide status reports and lake data as available to the Science Advisory Committee on a quarterly basis and invite the work group to in, be a part of those uh, meetings to look at that data. Um, and then also we will provide status reports back to you all every six months for the two years um, during two years after the drawdown to look at the progression of that. Uh, and one thing I wanted to mention too, um, in regards to the um, lakes, we do have the fish, um, fish consumption signs, we do have new stormwater pines, pond signs, and those new stormwater pond signs have a QR code which takes you to the water quality website. We did redo the water quality website a couple of years ago. It provides a lot of really good information on lakes, water quality management, stormwater ponds, all of that information as well. So in conclusion, Lake Munson is a shallow lake with areas of still water and it makes it susceptible to algae issues. It receives runoff from a large area, much of which is located in the city and was developed prior to environmental regulations. As recommended in the 1994 action plan, the focus has been on upstream improvements. And the city, county, and blueprint have invested more than $285 million on 28 major projects in the basin. And this is in addition to all of the proactive regulatory changes and ongoing maintenance that the county does and will continue to do as well as the best management practices and strategies the county has committed to moving forward. The Lake Munson recommendations include a plan drawdown with more frequent water quality testing, aerial topographic survey of Lake Munson to measure elevations of sediment, uh, to evaluate future in lake mitigation strategies, an enhanced vegetation management plan uh, for treating invasive plants, implementing periodic drawdowns on the lake in consultation with FWC to reduce that need to me mechanically harvest or dredge that sediment. The recommendations also capture requests sought by the work group, which include deployment of the hydrogen peroxide to treat algal blooms, the point source testing for PCBs and other contaminants, and continuation to work with the group, group, work group. 
And finally, the plan builds upon a decades of improvements in the basin through the multi-million dollar investments in ongoing and future infrastructure projects. All of these activities will be documented and status reports coming back to you every six months. And this holistic approach will allow the county to quickly mitigate the rapid growth of hydrilla and eliminate the algal bloom, while the long-term lake management actions will supplement the state's chemical treatment services and provide a higher level of service to what the county already provides. And commissioners, in case you have any questions about the county's past improvements or projects, you know, we touched a fraction of them. We're just going to post this document I think you're familiar with. It was provided yesterday. Just to give you an overview, if you have any questions on specific projects, happy to. Okay. Commissioners, we have 13 speakers. That's 39 minutes. Uh, if each speaker speaks for three minutes, I think that's right. I want to ask uh, the uh, vice chairman if he would please uh, administer that part of uh, this item for our speakers that have signed up. Thank you. Um, Mr. Administrator, before we get to speakers, speakers, again, we got 39 speakers. Uh, we want everyone to, of course, uh, speak every bit of what they want to say to the commission. Uh, if you want to wave in support of another speaker, that's totally fine. Or if you have a representative for a group uh, that wants to speak as well, that's totally fine as well. We'll start at the top and we'll go all the way through the bottom until we get through this thing. Mr. Administrator, our first speaker, do we, uh, and how many speakers do we have? Do we have any speakers online? We do not. We've got uh, 12 speakers. 12 speakers. All right, let's start from the top. Mr. Administrator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the first speaker, Max Epstein, to be followed by Sean McGlynn. Mr. Epstein, name and, record for, uh, name and address for the record, please, sir. You have three minutes once you get up there. Hey, everyone. Max Epstein, 1001 San Luis Road. Um, first of all, thank you. Um, this has been a very informative discussion. And I want to say that a lot of significant progress has been made, and there's a lot of good stuff in this action plan, but there's definitely a lot left to do. Um, Rick, your point about Commissioner Minor about the dredging is definitely a, a big sticking point. Um, the fertilizer ordinance, which I thought we were going to take a look at again, um, new information, a new study from IFIS shows that Fertilizer ordinance bans improve water quality in every instance over 30 years of data that they've looked at. Uh, Commissioner Maddox, I think your point about asking what's a stormwater pond, why do we call them lakes, is important. Because stormwater ponds have no water quality requirements whatsoever. If there's an algae bloom in them, it doesn't matter. Um, and we're building these things as community amenities without fences around them. We're inviting people and their pets to do this. Uh, I met Shauna Smith down at the Tallahassee Junction Park. There's no fence. Her little dog ran in the water. If it had gone a little farther south into the algae bloom, it might not still be here. Um, so I really appreciate your post, Brian, about the dog park. Immediately, the fence went up, and you said exactly what I've been trying. I wanted to hear from the commissioners about it being a stormwater facility. Put up a fence. That is what. Okay. That's great. Um, so couple quick things. I just want to focus on that meeting that the three of you went to in Woodville. Um, and these were regular people who showed up and they said, I can't walk around the lake anymore because of my asthma. That, that stuff doesn't have to be toxic to get up in the air. Someone asked about the dredging in Lake Jackson. They said, what about sediment removal? Well, you know, in the meetings with the county, um, we had Doug Barr, who was the head of the Northwest Florida Water Management Dis District for 20 years and had permitted both the Lake Jackson sediment removals. And he almost stood up and left after he s we were told that sediment removal is off the table. Because this is something that happens everywhere in the country and we can make it happen here. Um, then we talk about $285 million invested. Well, in 1994, when that report came out, would have cost us $4 million to remove the sediment in Lake Munson. This is about priorities and including that in our priorities. Um, it would have been a lot cheaper to do back then, but we can still do it now. So I've got a lot of other stuff I can say, but um, what we're really asking you for is to accept the status update and conduct the drawdown but we need to continue this conversation so we can all put our names on this action plan and be happy, like that 1994 report. Um, and we need to get away from saying this is naturally occurring. A forest fire is natural. 
dumping a million gallons of jet fuel or a million gallons of phosphorus, that is not natural. That Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sean McGlynn to be followed by Linda Rivers. The, the, the yellow light is 30 seconds, right? Yellow light is 30 seconds. Name that just for the record, please, sir. Sean McGlynn, 568 Beverly Court, Tallahassee, Florida. I'm on the board of directors of the Florida Lake Management Society. I'm the president of the Northwest Chapter. I'm on the board of directors of the Citizens Advisory Committee for Blueprint on the Florida Springs Institute and the Florida Water Resources Monitoring Council. So I have a, right now a lifetime of experience working with lakes all over the world. And um, it's, it's very confusing when we talk of our lakes as, as being not natural and not lakes. Christian Dozier touched on that, that the city used all our lakes as stormwater ponds initially. And it was the EPA and the TMDL thing that forced us to put the water in stormwater ponds and to protect our lakes. And we can make them beautiful and call them lakes, but those, but our lakes are lakes. And Lake Munson is a natural lake. EPA did the first TMDL on it. They decided it was a lake with uh, lobbying from the city against it. And every one of our other lakes has had the same situation, where they want them not to be lakes, but to be stormwater ponds. It's very important that Munson, unlike Jackson, actually had sewage going into it for decades. That was the outflow for this Tallahassee sewer plant. And all that stuff is still in the bottom of the lake. It's bad that there's all these toxins in the lake, too, and they are in the fish. The bugs and, and critters, worms and, and turtles and stuff mucking around in the sediment are pulling it up. And it's getting into the food train through the minnows, to the fish, and the people that eat the fish. That's why there's, a, there's an advisory. It's good that the, the actual toxins are sort of sequestered and held there until they're disturbed. But that also means that they can be moved without them falling out of the sediments. And particularly with the drawdown, Lake Munson is a karst lake. And that's the most endangered lake type in Florida. And it's supposed to go down every dry period into the sinkhole. The sinkhole is not in Lake Munson, but a couple, of, almost a mile south of the lake. And those weren't there in the colonial period. And the early settlers actually were able to take canoes from Tallahassee all the way to St. Mark's. And that was a trade route. And we're still finding dugout canoes from the Native Americans on these routes. So those sinkholes opened up, I'm not, I'm not sure when, but there's quite a, a, a few of them. And they're all south of the lake. There's no active sinkholes in the lake. Uh, our whole area is cars, so it, it's prone to this. And we were told that if you only dig down 10 feet, you won't far, form a sinkhole. And we dug out numerous lakes here in Tallahassee using that, that axiom with DP and permitting. Uh, the sediment disposal, the sediments in, in Lake Jackson were, had arsenic, just like the Munson ones. They were d dirty. The Phipps family actually took them to their property and let us dump them in the forest where it's caused a, um, a, a great growth of, of nutrients and, and vegetation and, and wildlife. Thank you, sir. So thank you very much. Thank you. Linda Thanks, Rivers to be followed by Lethan Kilgore. Ms. Rivers, name and address for the record, please, ma'am. Would you like for me to alert you when it gets to 30 seconds, or are you good with the light? I'm going to try to be brief. Sounds great. Linda Rivers, 5312 Trinidad Drive, Tallahassee. I, my backyard borders the lake. So I had this long thing. I was just going to read to you, but I'll just make it quick. Uh, we agree with the, the drawdown, and I think all these... These things that have been done upstream and the money that's been spent, that's all really great. But get this image. If you have a bathtub and you run crap in it for 30 years, and then you draw off the water on the top, but you don't take out the crap, and you put water back in the bathtub, what do you have? And that's what we're living around. And so uh, I do want to say about the algae blooms, that we do need a protocol, as Mr. Maddox had suggested, because I'll speak for myself. I followed the health department protocol all summer. The, the answer I got was that the health department is state, and the county had not asked them for help. And this is after four months. We also were told that peroxide treatments were being considered this summer 
to alleviate the algae blooms, and now we're told it's too late, it never happened. So there is distrust <laughs> um, amongst the, the work group in the county, and um, I hope that that can be alleviated. I hope we can all just get along. But it, this is not an academic question for us living on the lake. We need help, and we need it dredged. And there's got to be a way to do it, like in 2007 when the county, the state, and the city all agreed to it. And the only problem then was money and where to put it. And nothing has changed. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Next, Next speaker is Leith and Kilgore to be followed by Terry Mock. Name and address for the record, please, ma'am. Would you like for me to alert you at 30 seconds? Letha Kilgore, uh, 5406 Trinidad Drive. I bought my property in September of 1980. The next year, signs showed up saying no swimming, no fishing. It was 1981. Uh, they disappeared, and nothing ever came of it. Things have happened. We've had our drawdowns. I want to, what I want to do is to tell you something that happened this year that was fantastic and got disturbed. Sometime about three months ago, two months ago, about 54 snow white pelicans came to our beautiful lake. I, I clear my stress by looking at the diamonds on the water. And here came these snow white pelicans. And we get migrating birds that stay, come a few days. These stayed three weeks. And they were beautiful. They, and just, they flew every day. They went out and exercised and came back. And in case you're interested, they make a V just like geese. And they're huge, big birds. And they slept in a cove behind my house, and you could hear the cackling and things of them. And then, all of a sudden, the lake began to get dark, and the thing started growing. And one morning, they took off, and they didn't come back. And that's, that's what, it's a valuable thing that we have there. And I want, I just want to plead with you to please Let's do what we can to make, to do what we can to make it right, to make our lake good. And uh, I want to thank you. I thank everyone for their efforts, but uh, let us please find the answer to this problem. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Administrator, next speaker. Terry Mock to be followed by Gina Utz. Name and address for record, please, ma'am. Would you like an alert at 30 seconds, or are you good? No, I'm good. Uh, my name is Terry Mock. I live at 836 at Richard Road, Tallahassee, Florida. I'm a resident of the Fort Braden community, and we do not have a voice on this panel right now with Jimbo being gone. And at the last meeting, y'all chose to rename our community center, and that was wrong. So we are drafting up a grassroots campaign to try and get y'all to rethink that. We all love Jimbo. No one has anything negative about Jimbo. This is no insult to Jimbo's family. That is a historic building since 1926. It was the Fort Braden School. It is the Fort Braden Community Center. I live in Fort Braden. I don't live in Jimbo Jackson. I've reached out to you both to ask, what is the name of the community center? Can anyone tell me what it will be? Mr. Administrator. Jimbo Jackson Fort Braden Community Center. We, we don't want anybody's name on our community center. It is the community's community center. So I'm going to plead with y'all to readdress this. If you need to wait until we have a sitting a voice on this board, that would be great. If we have to wait for the new ones to come in. But we, we don't want this. And we have um, set up there last week for six hours and was able to garner 200 signatures saying they don't want this. We have an online petition that garnered 75 signatures, so give us time to fight. Come out there and meet with us. But for y'all to do this without public notification, advance notice was wrong. So I'm hoping you will reconsider. 
Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Commissioner Dozier? If I may. Um, thank you, ma'am. We may be getting into more speakers on the Fort Braden Community Center, um, which well, I want to hear from everyone, but I wanted to say that this issue was something I was going to bring up during comment time, and I do think there is a significant point here that we don't have a representative from District 2. Thank you. Um, so I think this is something we need to discuss and consider um, the Vice Chair's discretion of getting into it after right. we dispense with Lake months in discussion. Yeah. Um, but I would like to come back to that because it, we will have a representative from District 2 quite soon, and that person should be in place and engaged with the community. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, what I'd what I like to do is if, if there's any speakers, they have a speaker card specifically for the Fort Brain Community Center, what I would ask is that um, you wait until after this item, and I will allow you to speak. So what we'll do is those who are speaking specifically on Munson, I like for those people to speak now so we can stay on track. And then after after the Munson speakers, then I would like the Fort Brain speakers, Mr. Administrator. Does that work for you? That works great, Mr. Chairman. And yes, just, thank you. And just, uh, no, that was my fault. We I had those uh, speaker cards handed to me in a stack with the Lake Munson cards, so I've okay. since separated those. And thank you. We'll get to them, like you said. Thank you. The next speaker is Terry Ryan, to be followed by the final speaker, Bill Landing. Mr. Ryan. Name and address for the record, please, sir. Do you need me to alert you at 30 seconds? Yes. Good afternoon. Terry will... Ryan, co-founder of the Tallahassee Sewage and Wakulla Basin Advocacy Group. Thank you very much for having this conversation. $300 million over the last almost 30 years, and we still have harmful algal blooms along the Lake Munson. First of all, the work group recommends that Lake Munson be, be approved today to be drained sooner than later. Tomorrow? Second of all, regarding the sediment removal discussion, we request considerably more research statewide and nationally on whether toxic contaminants, and everybody knows the whole list of about 10 of them, found in the Lake Munson sediments in 2018 are linked to resident health issues, reduction in wildlife and fish populations, and ongoing fish consumption advisories. Again, more research is needed. Secondly, the 2019 DEP sediment study recommended that upstream water sampling be conducted to determine the sources of ongoing nutrients and toxin contaminants. This statement has, as we heard tonight, been questioned by staff and others. Therefore, I took the liberty of going back to the co-author of the study and asked to clarify his water sampling recommendation. Mr. Greenhaw not only confirmed his belief upstream sampling should be done, but actually provided me a step-by-step -step instructions. For example, quote, I am going to sample upstream tributaries, low energy sediment deposits, and or collect su suspended sediments during rainfall events using filtration. End of quote. We recommend, the work group recommends, that an intensive water quality nutrient sampling program be created starting with 200 to 250 samples over a one to two year period, depending on early results, and limited to five to six nutrients. Secondly, that toxin contaminated water column testing be created with the input of at least Mr. Greenhaw. Third of all, more study needs to be conducted on sediment removal. As noted, noted today, I received an email from Mr. Craig Diamond. Many of you may remember him as the former Chief of Environmental Planning, Tallahassee Leon County Planning Department. And I quote from Craig's email to me. I'll ask. Leaving the sediment and nutrients in buys time as big blooms will be delayed after the drawdown. However, the refill will have a burst of growth because the uppermost exposed layer will release nutrients that are now in unconsolidated friable matter. It would take many drawdowns to minimize that and yield a well-compacted layer that may not warrant further dredging. But that means there won't be a usable lake for many years during this sort of active lake level management." End of quote. Thus, if the sediment and nutrients, it will again, again, will, will again Per perpetrate harmful algal blooms Finish and up. detrimental to the health of resident Munson, Munson residents and more study needs to be done on the sediment renewal. For the remainder of the agenda, 
We approve the, the summary of the current status. We recommend that the rest of it go back to staff and the work group and re-review everything. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Well, Minister, we got more speakers on, on Monday. Final speaker, Dr. William Lane. Dr. Buchanan, name and address for the record, please, sir, and also Hi, like a 30-second. William Landing, I live at 304 Timber Lane Road, and I was uh, chair of the Leon County Science Advisory Committee for many years. Uh, I just want to address a couple of issues um, regarding dredging versus what happened in Lake Jackson. In Lake Jackson, when it drew, uh, draw down, drew down, uh, the sediments were allowed to dry and consolidate for more than a year. And then they were, a plan was put together, funding was brought together, and the sediments, uh, uh, a lot of that sediment was dredged out. Um, that would not occur in Lake Munson because it, there's not sufficient time um, uh, based on a drawdown that would start now and a refill in the spring. Um, regarding nutrient loading, I think it's clear that the, the water quality coming to the lake has gotten better. Um, we believe that the nutrients that are in the lake uh, the majority of the nutrients in the water column of the lake now are coming out of the sediments. We don't argue with that. And regarding PCB contamination, the uh, county does have a plan to check for PCBs in the incoming water. And if they find PCBs, then they would do additional testing. So uh, we support the, the county's plan. Thank you, sir. Any more speaker on, speakers on Monson? Sir, that concludes the speakers. Mr. Chair and Board, uh, we do. how many speakers do you have on the community center, Mr. Administrator? Here's be eight. All right. Um, we could go ahead with those speakers, but I think that would kind of chop up the conversation around months. And I think uh, what I like to do is get through this months in conversation. And then uh, if you all would like to hear the speakers, we can hear the speakers depending on time. You know, we uh, we have a public hearing at six. Mr. Chair, it's your, it's your pleasure on that. And I will give you back the gavel if you'd like to run this part, this section of the meeting. Mr. Vice Chair, I'd like to make a motion for uh, staff's recommendation here in Dr. Landing's uh, comments, uh, final comments that, uh, that they have agreed with the recommendations coming forward by staff. We have uh, spent um, an hour and 55 minutes on this matter. Uh, we have, uh, have been uh, written in graphs and maps and tables to death. Mm -hmm. And um, at some point, um, our staff has made a uh, recommendation undergirding uh, the syntheses of both, uh, including the tensions with uh, Commissioner Miners is lifted up. But when you're working with this many elements, uh, dealing with uh, uh, everything from septic to mm -hmm. sewer to upstream waters to the Florida Department of uh, uh, DEP to uh, this lake, uh, our staff says the majority, the majority of it is situated in the city, uh, and, and, and yet uh, the standards that we set have to be approved by uh, the state. Uh, this is a quagmire uh, involving uh, a tremendous mixture of, um, of um, it was just like brews, B-R-E-W-S. I make motion that we adopt staff recommendation options, I believe, one and two. Staff recommendation along with um, the actions described in the agenda item has been made by Commissioner Chairman Proctor. Is there a second to that motion? Seconded by Commissioner Cummings. Any additional comment? Seeing none, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Commissioner Dozier? Commissioner Dozier and Commissioner Cummings. Mr. Chair, I'd be happy to let Commissioner Cummings go first. You didn't get to finish your um, questions earlier, right? Commissioner Cummings? Oh, thank you. At this juncture, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, I just want to um, commend the citizens um, for being involved, being concerned. I had the opportunity to be involved in the town hall, and I want to thank our chair for, for convening the town hall and met many of the good people out there that are really concerned about uh, Lake Munson. But I want to also uh, just come in and thank the SAC and the citizens for working with uh, county staff. And I want to thank county staff for this historical analysis of, of all the attention and direction and resources that have been devoted 
to this issue, and we recognize it's a very serious issue and it's ongoing, but I believe that we are at a point where we can we can move forward. I, I appreciate the scientists' uh, uh, recommendation, yes, but, I, but I think that <clears throat> working together has gotten us to this point. Uh, a lot of the contentions have been resolved, and I think we just have to now move forward with the recommendation, do the drawdown, and see where we are. And I think in the middle of the stream, uh, even in the final analysis, we can always change courses if from a scientific standpoint it merits that. So I just want to just commend everybody, and especially the citizens, for being, coming out being involved. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Vice President. Commissioner Dozier, followed by Commissioner Minor. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, or Vice Chair. Um, I am going to stay up front that this is an extensive report, incredible work by our staff as county administrator. You all went deep, and I know the um, county attorney's office as well, to the work groups, the residents. There's been a lot of time and attention on this. We've been waiting for this for a while. And with respect to the chair, you keep quoting the time here that we've spent on this issue, and you may not like getting into the weeds, but this is our only opportunity to hear from the public and discuss it among the six of ourselves. So we do need to take the time here. And on the other hand, we can't solve every single issue tonight. Um, I think we do have a lot of good progress in this item, a lot of good progress working together, but um, I see this as... I would say the start of a new phase of this discussion. Mm -hmm. There have been a lot of work over the years, mm -hmm. and Ms. County Administrator, to document that and to align it with your good summary of all the projects that have happened and ongoing. I mean, we talk about these projects individually. Getting those in a, you know, one document is really helpful. So this is going to be an ongoing conversation, and probably not surprising, I'm, I got a smile on my face when um, Anna mentioned innovative uh, technologies because this is going back to the strategic initiative we adopted um, in 2018, right? Um, or 19, I think it was in 19. Um, and that was the intent of that. And to hear that kind of, I mean, you all are always great about referencing our strategic plan and those initiatives and the items, and that's good. This is exactly why I introduced it in the board. I mean, um, we have, I may have brought it into a retreat, but the staff has gone above and beyond trying to implement that. It was for this reason, so that when we come to some of these issues, we can look for innovative solutions because we know more than we did in the early 2000s. We know more than we did in the 90s. Um, but we still don't know everything. There's a lot more study, a lot more research that needs to happen. So, um, Ms. County Administrator, in this Maybe a question for you, maybe a question um, for Anna, but um, in response to additional questions in the email you shared with us about dredging, I mean, like Commissioner Miner said earlier, I mean, this, we're, we're hearing really smart, good people talk about this in different ways. I have heard concerns about um, Wakulla Springs and dredging and, you know, having sediment, you know, kind of loosened up and flowing that way. Um, but if I'm not mistaken, you had said that the first step to considering anything like that is to know what we've got. And that will come during this next drawdown phase, correct? We're going to get new information, information we haven't had in a long time. And there could be other discussions while the lake is drawn down at this point. However, the... The focus, I mean, the funding would not be there. That would be a longer-term plan should the board, should the staff ever move in that direction. Is that correct? That's accurate. Okay. So I don't think that's off the table. I think having a discussion once the lake is drawn down and looking at these factors, it, we would have to look for funding. The board, the county would have to look for funding, um, would have to look for a location, all of that, but really making sure we don't have other impacts. Um, it's hard to say, I mean, just kind of from a water quality perspective, the cap is good. Let's not disturb it because we, we don't want this stuff in the ground. I mean, that's it. We are dealing with a lot of history here and a lot of other factors. 
So I am in the middle. Um, I mean, at this point, I couldn't move forward with dredging based on what we know, but I think we find more information and make sure, you know, you've got those regular updates, the communication works. I'm glad the work group will be engaged. Um, I'm just looking at my notes here. Uh, I will say, Mr. County Administrator, um, and I'm just going to make this comment. We don't have to get into it. There was one line about uh, potential burning of vegetation in Upper Lake Lafayette, and it was deemed not acceptable because of liability issues. I'm just going to say this. Um, this is an unusual night because i got to pack everything in. Y'all forgive me. It's my very last full commission meeting with you. Um, there was a lot of different opinions on that issue. There was some liability, but there was other ways to work that out. Tall Timbers had other ideas about that, so I just encourage the board to keep looking at that issue in Upper Lake Lafayette or any of our lakes in the future if burning should, um, should be helpful. Um, on the health issues, I mentioned this last time. This is a tough one um, because it may not impact everybody. It may just be those of us who are more sensitive to chemicals and toxins. Um, we have two phenomenal universities in this town, and there are a lot of studies. Ms. County Administrator, you mentioned the state is studying this issue right now. Um, Mr. Chair, if you would, um, and unless, Mr. County Administrator, you plan to do this already, um, I would appreciate adding to the motion, bringing back um, an agenda item once those studies about the health impacts of um, stormwater and the water bodies, algae, things like that, um, once that study is produced by, by the state, I think bringing that back could be very helpful. This is not the only area where we might have that issue. Mr. Chair, would you accept that as an amendment to your motion? Ms. County Administrator, could you share, would that be uh, problematic in any we, way? Absolutely. We, we're planning to bring it, that back anyway in our updates. But, uh, well, but if we got it before an update was scheduled to come back, we would, we would just naturally do that. So it's consistent with how we would treat that. That's yes, yes, Ms. Vice Chair, I accept it. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, all right. So, again, there's so many different issues we could go into here. Um, I'm just going to mention the last two. Um, like so many different things in our region, water management districts and others, the Big Bend region gets less funding than everybody else in the state. That is just the bottom line. So. Um, we're going to have a legislative uh, workshop on our legislative agenda on the 25th. Um, I think we might, should bring something like this up, talk with Water Management District, others may not be optimistic about getting more funding from the state this cycle, but I think that should go into our legislative discussion because a lot of Water Management Districts have more money to fund projects like these. Um, and Mr. County Administrator, thank you for reminding me of that during our briefing, because this has come up in our Floor Association of Counties conversations and many others. Um, lastly, we had nearly an hour discussion at Blueprint meeting um, a couple weeks ago um, on water quality issues, on Capital Cascade Segment 4, and as it related to Munson and Henrietta. If you all remember at that, at that meeting, um, Mr. Vice Chair, I think you were making a motion about, and we did get a report bring, coming back from Blueprint staff um, on potentially expanding the study area. Mm -hmm. What we see, I think this is attachment one. This is the map I assume the Blueprint Board's gonna get in December. The St. Augustine Basin is enormous and it is mostly in the city, as Anna said. And um, I mean, just the fact that it extends past I-10 to the north, to Southwood, all over downtown, the, the type of stormwater that is coming into Munson is urban stormwater. That's what we're trying to clean up. It's also a legacy, perhaps, of any kind of contaminants, development, other things from the past. This is why a city-county workshop and looking at this watershed, I believe, is more appropriate than a Blueprint project because Blueprint does not have the money to address these things and it could come in a, I mean, the mitigation could go on for, it has been going on and could go on for a long time. So um, we already have the direction for staff on Blueprint, but I think when that comes back, this is, I just wanted to flag that. This is why um, I think this needs to be a city-county discussion. 
That is it, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you. Commissioner Minor. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I'll be, I'll be concise. Um, Anna, Ken, everybody else who worked on the agenda item, thank you. This is excellent work. It's a good plan. I know there's some disagreements on, on parts of it, uh, but I do think it's a good plan, and, and the worker group supports the drawdown and, and other aspects of it. Um, thank you very much for all your work on this. Um, you know, when we have this next status report on Lake Munson, we will likely be in the midst of the drawdown. Um, I don't think this needs to be included in the motion, but I'd like to request um, from the county administrator that, that that next status report on Lake Munson include within it a section that provides um, some more information on possible health impacts of legacy contaminants and sediment um, around, because Lake Munson, this is, surely this is not a unique situation to Leon County. There are lakes similar to this all around the country that probably have similar types of decades of uh, sediment deposits. Um, it'd be helpful, I think, for us to, to have this dredge or not dredge discussion if we had more detail about what other communities in Florida or elsewhere around the country have a similar situation to ours in Lake Munson. Uh, what are the health impacts on that? Have there been any studies on those other communities uh, that they have had with regard to PCBs, chromium, uh, other things inherent in the sediment? Uh, that has been left to, 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 be, to stay there, right? Uh, because that, that's one of the main concerns I know that people who live along Lake Munson are, uh, are interested in. Um, does, does living along there with, this, with the contaminants in the sediment pose a health risk? And so I think putting a section in our next staff report that, that sheds some more light on that based on what other communities have dealt with would be very helpful. Uh, Mr. County Administrator, do you, do you need a, that to be part of the motion or is that something that can be done without one? I don't think so. We can include that. <clears throat> okay. All right. Um, Mr. Vice Chair, thank you very much. I'm done. Thank you. I have no more speakers in queue to speak. Uh, all those in favor of the motion on the floor indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, motion carries unanimously. What I would like to say before we go any further is that I appreciate staff's work with the community on this issue. Uh, when I met with the county administrator, he talked about all of the things that, the, that was on the checklist from the community that we were able to accomplish as a result of us uh, sending uh, staff into meetings with, uh, with the community group on this and them being able to sit at a table across from each other and make things work. Uh, the sediment issue is one that, again, we've all talked about. Um, you, you got conflicting sciences there on, on, on one side and the other. Uh, what, I, what I would say is what we got right now, we're looking at, we look, we're looking at doing a drawdown. It gives us an opportunity to do something out there that's going to help delay that we all can agree on. And um, as, as we move forward, uh, using the peroxide and other things like that, that's just, um, it's my hope that we won't end up with the same problems that we've had over and over again in Lake Monson. Um, I don't know if the sediment conversation is over yet, but what I am saying is that I'm pleased at this point where we are in us being able to draw the lake down and those and the citizens having some comfort in that some concessions were made from the county in their favor with some of the things they have asked for. So this may be a to be continued type of conversation. Uh, it may, as Commissioner Dozier said, it may end with us having that joint workshop with the city to have deeper conversations about it as well. But this is a positive start from where we were, what, three, four meetings ago uh, when we had some angry citizens that didn't think we cared about Munson at all. So staff, uh, Mr. Administrator, thank you so much for for uh, taking our direction, hearing our, hearing our constituents out. And um, like I said before, this, does, this may not be the end, but this is a good start in us making sure that we uh, create the amenity months is supposed to be for the community that is said. That is the end of that. Uh, agenda item number 26. Uh, Mr. Administrator, I was just reminded by the chair that uh, the Fort Bray Community Center conversation is a non-agenda item, and because it's a non-agenda item, those citizens will be pushed later to the, in the agenda to uh, speakers on non-agenda items. So. Um, we're at 510. Mr. And Mr. Chair, if you want to continue, we can continue or we can go ahead and take a break until 6. Um, Ms. Vice Chair, let us take a break and uh, I think that we have a short order in remaining. Yes, sir. And, uh, when we come back, we are entertaining uh, those persons' desires to speak. All right, we are recessed until 6 o'clock. Thank you. All right.